Good morning, everyone, and just want to welcome you today, um, this Sunday, which is Father's Day in New Zealand. Um, just want to um, acknowledge all our fathers, whether they be with us today or have passed, um, but also just um, remembering for us who are fathers as well. I just want to start the day with this short verse. I've been going through Isaiah um, in this time. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. So just want to pray that you will find this time a blessing as we... Um, look into further um, about the story of Joseph. Let me just pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for our fathers, and we pray for us who are fathers that we can be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
So one of the things I've been doing, um, probably like most of you, um, especially in the evening, is um, watching a lot of Netflix. And um, Paul and I kind of exchange notes on shows that we've been watching, which have been really good, and some which have been really average. Um, the last show uh, that I watched last night was actually surprisingly really good. It was called... Um, Shackleton's Captain, I think. I think it was Shackleton's Captain. Anyway, it was actually a New Zealand-made um, recreation drama of Ernest Shackleton, who um, basically tried to um, go to the South Pole. And uh, for many of you who don't know the story, what happened was that he got marooned on ice. Now, his captain was actually a guy called um, Frank Worsley. He was actually a New Zealander. And... Uh, what happened was that when they got stuck on the ice, essentially they couldn't get out of there. So basically they had to take their three lifeboats um, and sail to this um, godforsaken um, island, which is just above the uh, South Pole called Elephant Rock. Um, and then it was pretty obvious that they couldn't really stay there. So what happened was this guy, Frank Worsley and Ernest Shackleton and this other guy, a few other guys, then... Um, took one of the other boats and then sailed all the way um, on this really small boat using only a sextant, remember they didn't have GPS in those days, um, to to the um, to these islands basically, um, not to the Falkland Islands but it was somewhere else, I think South Georgia Islands or something like that anyway. Um, so when they got there they managed to surprisingly get there alive and but they were on the wrong side of the island so they had to then endure a 36-hour trek across the islands to get to this whaling station at the end. Um, but, you know, it's just amazing, amazing story, real-life story. This is not made up about the endurance and the hardship they had to go to because once Shackleton got to the whaling station, he then um, wanted to get... He Then he basically hired a boat a few months later to basically rescue the remaining men that were stuck on this... Godforsaken rock and called Elephant Rock in the middle of, of the Antarctic. Now, um, one of the things which happened was when they were sort of, when the three of them were traversing the island that they came upon to get to the whaling station, they did notice something that, you know, it was it was really dangerous because, you know, it had never been trans traversed before. And um, what they found was that uh, when they were when they were sort of traversing down the mountains, instead of the three men, they felt that there was a fourth person there. And um, just in sense of guiding them and stuff like that. And Shackleton acknowledged that he thought it was through, due to providence or God's providence. Um, so I suppose it was just a really, in some ways, a really interesting story. One, it was, it was like a real-life action movie. 
um, but it was actually a New Zealander was actually part of this, who was part of this uh, rescue mission to save all the men that um, all the men survived essentially. So sorry if that was a bit of a spoiler. And I suppose even though we may feel that we're going through a bit of a hard time at the moment, really it's nothing compared to what so many people have gone through. But um, we will endure, and God is our fourth man, and um, will, is here with us. Um, despite the circumstances. So let me pray. Father God, thank you again for this time. We pray for New Zealand. We pray for Auckland, especially as we go through this um, level four lockdown. Pray that COVID can be kept under control. We pray for the church and those especially who um, who will find it really difficult this time. Really pray they can draw solace and strength from the knowledge that you are there regardless of the circumstances we pray for those who are unwell we pray for those we pray for the activities of the church especially around union street that that will be expedited and be blessed and so we thank you for this time in jesus name amen Everybody and uh, welcome again to our service online and I hope wherever you are in your bubble you are doing okay do feel free please to reach out and connect with one another and uh, and myself as well well the story of Joseph has been told and retold for centuries and for good reason it's a fantastic story it has all the ingredients Murder, almost, family drama, palace intrigue, exotic love interest, almost, tense middle bit, and a spectacular finale. It's a great story, and a book of great stories. As our family sat in the Civic Theatre four years ago and enjoyed Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice's musical, Joseph and his amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, I thought to myself, wow, all these people are here to look at and listen to a Bible story. Wouldn't it be great if the Bible became a topic of conversation in our land? Have you read the latest episode of David or Esther or Jonah? I couldn't help binging the entire New Testament over the weekend. Okay, well that might be a little far-fetched. But let me tell you about a dream that was just as hard to believe and a dreamer by the name of Joseph. 
Joseph grew up in the land of Canaan, which is a sliver of land in the eastern Mediterranean. He was one of 12 brothers, and like all brothers, there was plenty of friendly, or maybe not so friendly, rivalry between them. This was not helped by the fact that Joseph was his dad's favourite son. Now parents, I really recommend you don't have favourites among your kids, or at least don't let on that you do. It's generally not a good idea. You see, the other siblings don't tend to appreciate this, even in the best of families. As the brothers sing in the musical, being told we're also Rans does not make us Joseph fans. To make matters worse, Jacob gave his favourite son an ornate robe to wear. Sorry to disappoint you, but this was probably not a coat of many colours of popular imagination, but a long sleeve coat that showed Jacob's Joseph's status as a manager and not a labourer. Yep, guess who didn't have to do the dirty work? Joseph's dad might as well have written the book How to Lose Friends and Infuriate People and given it to Joseph. Some people think that Joseph was a spoiled brat, but I reckon, I reckon that he genuinely wanted to do the right thing. He just wasn't always, how shall I put it, aware of how he came across. On one occasion he reported back to his dad some mischief that his brothers had got up to. And you can read about the sorts of things that some of his brothers did in surrounding chapters. So Joseph was probably right on the money on that. Wise? Hmm, maybe not so much. Then Joseph had a couple of dreams, which he shares with his brothers and his father. In the first dream, he and his brothers are binding sheaves of corn out on the field, when suddenly Joseph's sheaf rose and stood upright, and his brothers' sheaves all bowed down to it. In the other dream, the sun, the moon, and the stars all bowed down to him. Wow. Well, it goes without saying that Joseph's brothers did not appreciate these dreams. In fact, the scripture says they hated them, hated him all the more, and it repeats it for emphasis. By the way, does this sound like anyone to you? They hated him without reason. We will see as we go through the story the fascinating parallels with Jesus' story as well. So the stage is set for the brother's monstrous act. And I'll get Rachel to read this next part of the story. Genesis chapter 37 verses 12 to 36. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing their, the sheep at Shechem. Get ready, and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. So J Jacob sent him on his way, and Joseph travelled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. When he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for? he asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they are pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man told him. They have moved on from here, but I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found them there. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of those cisterns. We can tell our father, a wild animal has eaten him. 
then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then, just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming towards them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm and aromonic ar resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up this crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, The boy is gone. What will I do now? Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look at what we've found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it is my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. I will go to my grave mourning for my son, he would say, and then he would weep. Meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt, where they sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. Here ends the reading. Definitely taken a turn for the worse for Joseph, haven't they? I'm grateful for Jer to Jerry Wright for some of the word pictures in his excellent little book, The Joseph Road, as we follow Joseph to Egypt. So here was Joseph, abandoned in a pit. He would have been terrified and bewildered. What would happen next? Perhaps he thought at first that they were just having some sadistic fun at his expense. Okay, guys, you can let me out now. Guys? Then he overheard their conversation. Kill him. Teach him a lesson, etc. In that dark hole, he began to shake with cold and fear. Surely one of the brothers would come to rescue him. Later, he heard a jumble of voices. He could pick up bits and pieces of the trade language. They were negotiating to sell him as a slave. He'd heard of the fate of the slaves sold to these Midianite merchants. Maybe murder was a better option. Soon a rope came dangling down. He was roughly commanded to put it around his chest and under his armpits. As he was dragged upward, his brothers disappeared. The Midianite traders tied his wrists and shackled his feet. Then the caravan began to move again. He was shoved along roughly as days and nights ran together. He numbly realized his fate. He cried out to God as his prayer life 
um, having a significant growth, growth spurt at that time. He wept at night, wondering why God had allowed this. He wished now that he hadn't been so arrogant with his brothers. In retrospect, he could see how they had been provoked to resent him. But it was too late. His fate was sealed, though he had no idea what that fate was. So here was Joseph, a helpless, pampered teenager, ripped from his family, betrayed by his brothers, now little more than a piece of human flesh. His trek to Egypt must have tested his endurance beyond anything he thought possible. He would have walked while his Midianite captors rode on camels. His feet were blistered, but his legs became strong. His captors put him to work whenever they stopped. Wood for fire, pitching tents, bringing food. His survival instincts began to replace his fear. He resolved to not only live, but to stay strong. In the days and weeks that followed, his mu muscles toughened. And as the caravan came to the strange land and cities along the Nile, Joseph's arms were bound behind his back and his feet were hobbled to prevent his escape. Then he was sold. Sold to a man named Potiphar, captain of the guard, no less. As a new slave, Joseph probably began by doing manual labour, cleaning latrines, washing floors, tending animals and dozens of other undesirable tasks. The way he did these things must have caught Potiphar's eye. He performed his tasks well. He worked hard and didn't complain. He earned Potiphar's trust and was given more responsibility. It seemed that Joseph was making the, the best out of a bad situation. Genesis 39 verse 2. <clears throat> the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. He lived in the land of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favour in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything that he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Wow! So Joseph ends up managing Potiphar's in entire household because he has proved himself such a trustworthy manager and Potiphar has been so blessed through it. But it would be a mistake to think that Joseph simply breezed through this time. He must have had his low moments, times of anxiety and sleeplessness, times of mistreatment and from others. Most important of all, he had no options. If he wanted to leave, he couldn't. He had only his resolve to live well and faithfully before God in his terrible circumstances. Now Potiphar's wife was bored. There are only so many cocktail parties and shopping expeditions that you can do. But when she saw Joseph well-built and handsome, and probably much younger in his late teens or early twenties, she lusted after him. At first it was innuendo, a slight touch, a look of the eye. But when the slave Joseph didn't respond to her feminine wiles, she gave him a command. Come to bed with me. Was Joseph tempted? It would be hard to imagine that he was not. For she spoke to him day after day, imploring him to give in. But he refused. He would not give in. 
Even in those days, this was a novel approach. For Joseph had a tremendous sense of loyalty to his master. Verse 8. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in the house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to David day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. Why did he refuse to sin? A lesser man would have thought, my master gives me so much freedom I could get away with this as long as Mrs. Potiphar doesn't say anything. This could be one of the perks of the position. But it appears that Joseph didn't even entertain such thoughts. Why? Because he feared God more than he feared man or woman. But of course, sometimes the good choices that we make are not rewarded. Sometimes the golden rule wins out. He who has the gold or the power or the advantage makes the rules. Joseph was framed and his robe left in Mrs. Potiphar's hands as he fled, used as evidence against him. <clears throat> when she brings the false accusation to her husband, he responds by burning with anger. But who was he angry at? Now, it is likely that he didn't actually believe his wife. That given a test of characters between her and Joseph, he knew who should win. But she was his wife, and Joseph was just his slave. He cannot discount his wife's accusation without publicly humiliating her and by reflection himself. If he is certain that she is lying, even if she, he is certain that she is lying. The action he takes against Joseph is as minimal as it can be and still retain his family's honour. He puts him in the king's prison. Okay, it wasn't the Sheraton, but there were worse methods of punishment in Egypt, I can assure you. But even there in prison, the Lord was with Joseph, and he blessed him. So that's part one of our story. <clears throat> Here's a question for you. What is the purpose of the Joseph story? Why is it in the Bible? And not just in the Bible, the story covers more chapters than the story of Abraham. Well, let's collect some clues. Clue number one, 37 verse 2, this is the account of Jacob's family line. The author then proceeds to tell us Joseph's story. Joseph's story is part of the larger story of his family. Jacob is one of the patriarchs, the first three generations of Abraham's line from which came Israel. Abraham, his son Isaac, and his son Jacob. And then in fact, Jacob was renamed Israel and his 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. Actually, God subtracted Levi from the count of tribes and added in Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, but we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. Clue two. Check out the further references to Joseph in the Bible. There aren't that many of them, but they're there. Psalm 105 recounts the wonders that God has done in keeping his covenant promises to give his people a land of their own. <clears throat> he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons. How does Joseph relate to God keeping his promise to give them a land of their own? Because when he was born, his family were nomadic shepherds squatting in a land not their own. But by the time of his death, they still didn't have their own land, but thanks to Joseph, 
they had survived a terrible famine and drought and were beginning to really flourish in Egypt. The stage was set for the exodus and the conquest of Canaan many years later. Then we have Stephen's address in Acts chapter 7, which uh, he does a similar thing by reciting Israel's history and placing Joseph's life in that context. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. And then the writer to the Hebrews writes, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Again, Joseph's story is set in the larger story of God's promises to Israel to be a great nation and to have a land of their own to bless other nations. Clue three. And then, of course, there's Joseph's statement in chapter 50, verse 20, right at the end of the book of Genesis, in which he says to his brothers, after Jacob has died, <clears throat> you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. As the story unfolds, we discover that out of Joseph's seemingly disastrous situation will come great good for that whole region of the world. God will bring great good out of great evil. So putting all these clues together, the genius of Joseph's tale is revealed. God will bring his purposes to pass, even in the most impossible of situations. This is where you and I will find great comfort in this story. Whatever circumstances you are in, no matter how difficult, you can trust in God. His purposes may take a long time to be revealed, but you can be assured that God is up to something. But there's a problem. There's a problem. What is the problem beside the obvious hellish situation? Just as Joseph didn't have the benefit of knowing Genesis 50 verse 20 ahead of time, neither can we see how things will work out when we are going through stuff. Remember Job? The book of Job is an ancient book which addresses the vexing issue of undeserved suffering. Job is never given a reason for his suffering, but get this, we, the reader, know the reason all along. Satan has asked permission to terrorize Job so much because he reckons Job is only good because he is rich and happy. And God lets him test his servant Job, test his faith because he's confident that it is more than skin deep. Just as Job must go through the journey without seeing the destination, so must Joseph and so must we. We don't get to skip ahead, but we can be absolutely confident of God's presence throughout and his purposes overall. God's presence is more than a sense of peace, but it certainly is that. It is his active, energizing grace, enabling us to persevere in the most extreme of circumstances. The Apostle Paul um, was driven to distraction by what he called his thorn in the flesh, and God revealed to him this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my, um, where, where, where is it, uh, for my power, sorry, is made perfect in weakness. How are you going on your journey? Are things pretty cruisy, perhaps like Joseph before his coat uh, turned to chains? That's fantastic. Don't take it for granted. Keep that relationship with God fresh 
during this lockdown period is a real opportunity to build back if you've been a bit sloppy with those habits build those back into your daily routine Rachel and I have adopted uh, something just this last week or two um, Lectio 365 and I really thoroughly uh, recommend it it's an app on Android and on Apple you can you can uh, you can go through and of course I've been using the new version Bible reading app for some years as well it's not all about apps though is it it's about a relationship with Jesus keeping that fresh and alive you see folks there are no shortcuts it is very difficult if not impossible to stay on the path without the help of others but it is God's grace that we must come back to time and time again for his forgiveness, cleansing, and power. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. But maybe you're more like Joseph. You're in the Winnie the Pooh and not much Winnie. You can't see the road ahead. You can't see how the circumstances of your life can possibly bring anything useful at all. This is the story for you because there is always hope. During his years in Nazi death camps during World War II, Viktor Frankl observed that the prisoners who exercised the power to choose how would they, they would respond to their circumstances displayed dignity, faith and inner vitality. They found a way somehow to transcend their suffering. Some chose to believe in God in spite of all the evidence to the contrary. They chose to expect a good tomorrow, though there was little promise of one. They chose to love however hateful the environment that they were in. He concluded that these prisoners transcended their circumstances because they found meaning in their suffering. We have a hope that sustains us even in the worst of circumstances. Hope in God's unchanging and unfailing love. Hope in his ultimate sovereignty. Hope in God's ultimate triumph over evil and injustice through Christ our Lord. As the narrator states in the musical, I've read the book and you come out on top. Hope in his personal care and concern for us. Hope that he has a plan to use our lives for the glory of God and the good of others. And one day we shall be like his son, Jesus. Hope goes beyond intellectual reason. It springs from a reservoir deep within us. It has been conditioned by months and years of walking with Jesus. It comes from trusting the goodness of God in the simple areas of life and learning to trust him for the bigger areas as well. Can we trust God? Can we trust God to ultimately bring justice even when all we see is injustice? Can we be assured that he will take from the rabbit trails of our lives, where he will make from the rabbit trails of our lives a highway for his kingdom? You bet we can trust that he will do that. We must. That was the challenge for Job and for Joseph and for us. And it's not easy. Though God is so worthy because we are human and finite and sinful and often quick to give up God's timetable have you ever noticed is quite different from our own we're going to see this play out in the story of Joseph over the next couple of weeks Joseph is more than a great musical and fun story or the other way around it helps us see that our circumstances may be a very bad chapter in a very good book. 
Joseph's story is a message from God directly to us which says, Trust me, I know what I am doing. I am the rock that you can cling to. I am Jesus, the cornerstone. In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth. Your way is perfect. Your word is flawless. You shield all who take refuge in you. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. Sing this with us. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood.
Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, share this with your friends and family and say, hey, we're doing this series on Joseph. Check it out. There's so much uh, that people can um, learn from it, even if they don't normally listen to sermons like this. And I invite you to join with me, if you would like, in the blessing today. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.